Thanks for joining us for our weekly discussion, Moral Side of the News. We're glad you're alongside. I'm John Blim with the WHAS Crusade for Children. As always, joining me, a distinguished panel today, Dr. Marion Taylor, South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church, Reverend Daniel Corey Schull, Burnett Avenue Baptist Church, Father Joe Graffis, Archdiocese of Louisville, and we welcome back after a few months away, Reverend Sally McLean, retired Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Welcome back, Sally. Thank you. Our first topic, some parents I know are celebrating the news that Jefferson County Public School students will be welcomed back to the classroom this week. After a year of online learning, a hybrid schedule will be offered students with in-person lessons two days a week. That means three days a week, we'll still be at home online. In-person learning will look a lot different with health protocols to reduce, reduce student interaction with their classmates during things like group assignments and lunch. I turn to our panel now and begin with Reverend Daniel Corey Shule, a JCPS board member, for your reaction. I think that uh, there is a mix of excitement and a mix of concern as it relates to the return to school uh, next week. Uh, but it is true that uh, it has been a long year of virtual learning. And um, we're hoping that some benefit emerges from uh, re-entering buildings uh, amid the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, this is more side of the news. So I think that all people of faith should remember uh, JCPS in your prayers and your warmest thoughts uh, in the coming week that everything may go well, that safety uh, might be accomplished for every student and every staff person. I'll just uh, jump in there and, and agree with you on that. And also just, I, I realize that this is not everything that everybody wants. Um, for parents, you know, you're still gonna have your kids at home, even if you've got a job. Um, for the teachers, there's that much more to juggle and chaos uh, in their lives. It is more complex than usual. But I really want us to try to look on the bright side and notice uh, where some very positive things need to be pointed out. Um, I wanted to say, for instance, about the special education piece of this, that there is an exception for the kids who have exceptional needs and they're gonna get the extra attention that they need and that they deserve. Um, I wanna put in a little plug for the Crusade for Children because we've been having these interviews uh, and we've been hearing a lot from just amazingly dedicated and highly trained educators. And they've been planning hard and uh, very intently to make sure that they have uh, the ability to give that special education attention that's needed. Um, and we've been helping them have what they need, the special equipment for classrooms and so on. So that's one piece. I also wanted to notice, note the question about suspensions. Isn't that fascinating that kids who are suspended may not be suspended from getting an education. <laughs> they just may be removed from one classroom experience into another environment. That's pretty cool. Um, and then quarantine, that quarantine also doesn't have to mean being removed from an educational experience. So this hybrid approach is turning out to have some amazing unexpected advantages. Uh, so I didn't want us to, to miss the chance to celebrate some of the good things here. That's if we can keep Frankfurt uh, out of educators business. <laughs> Uh, sort of, I think you're right. I was looking forward to being able to use virtual education um, to decrease snow days. So that was a couple of years back. I don't remember the year exactly where uh, the school year um, had to be extended because of snow days and some other events that happened. And that could have been totally uh, limited uh, or had we had the option of doing NTI, but now there are individuals in Frankfurt who want to limit the school district's um, flexibility to do NTI. And so I, I, I agree that uh, it seems to me that we have learned a new way to do education, but there are some who are uh, pretty determined 
to pull uh, JCPS back into more traditional styles of education. The positive notions, to, uh, I guess this week is the anniversary of the beginning, the official, whatever that meant, uh, beginning of the pandemic, which it seems like 10 years ago and then yesterday. And, you know, I, I, I'm very grateful that our teachers, for the most part, have all been vaccinated. Uh, a lot of states did not do that, and I'm grateful that they were considered uh, uh, essential workers. Uh, thank God for nurses and all the people in the hospital. But I think, as Marion has said, one of the things uh, for those of us who've been going through hearings, the amount of creativity on, of all agencies and teachers especially, but so many other areas We've learned a lot, as you said, Corey, about a lot of different things and things we never even, I didn't think I knew what Zoom was a year ago. <laughs> um, and, and, and the potential uh, of, of those kind of things. On the other hand, kids do need socialization. They need classrooms. And I'm grateful that they're getting back to some classrooms, especially the little ones who really need that probably as much as anybody. Uh, NTI has been a great thing, although, Corey, you know better than I, that uh, some of our minority families and disadvantaged families, uh, I'm not sure it's been the best thing for those kids. Uh, and I'm afraid they're gonna lose a lot of time just because they need a classroom. And um, so there are pluses and minuses of all of this, but I mean, there's so many good things. I mean, this fact, I, I get my vaccine tomorrow, the last one, and uh, who would have thought we'd have three vaccines a year ago or any vaccines and thank God for all of that. So there are hopeful signs. Um, I, I'm worried about uh, the JCPS because the hybrid model, while I understand it's a compromise, it's going to throw consternation into families, teachers. Teachers have been going crazy, I know. Uh, so there's there's difficulties with all of it, but maybe we'll learn something out of all of it. And going forward, we might have a lot more tools in the bag than we've ever had before. On a positive note, another positive note, uh, both my husband and I have been sick with COVID and our uh, son was able to come in from Virginia and bring his children and they could do school from our home, which was really an advantage that wouldn't have happened. Of course, none of this would have happened if COVID hadn't happened. But again, that was a very good thing for our family. And then another, <laughs> just a little anecdote that our neighbors um, have five children and I can't imagine what she's gone through, three or in elementary school. Uh, but one in particular did not like school at all. So he was out the other day and I said, well, how, how's it going with school? And he said, oh, it's good. It's good. I am so glad to be in school. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> good, that, that helps. That, you know, it used to be, oh, well, we've got a snow day, so we don't have to go. But I, I think that's made a difference. So with the vaccine and with some school returning like two days a week and so forth, do you get a sense that this is a feeling of we are getting back to normal? I'm not sure we're ever going to be back to normal, normal. And maybe we shouldn't be back to normal, normal, because there's a lot of issues that have come up over the last year that we need to deal with, not just schools. Or we'll deal with that topic a little bit later today. But, um, I, you know, I think maybe it's a new normal. And it seems to me I'm hoping we look learn from the positive lessons of the past year and we can kind of, I mean, I think the schools, Corey would probably agree that <clears throat> schools are gonna need lots of help in the next year, the whole catch up process and, and, and all the stuff that goes along with that. Uh, we probably need to invest a lot more in schools than we, we have. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that there's positive things, but that doesn't mean normal means, well, we just go back and <clears throat> everything like it used to be. No, it, it's got to be different. It's got to be better. It, it need, we need to do a lot of investment in public education uh, in, uh, because we have so many students who have been adversely impacted by uh, COVID-19. My, my fear is that those who have been most 
impacted by COVID-19 are also students who are already disadvantaged and were already not mm -hmm. um, excelling in the ways that we would want them to in public education. And so, you know, we hear about the achievement gap, which is really an opportunity gap, which is born of, you know, all, uh, you know, of, uh, all of these variables um, that really stem from the way this city is economically stratified, um, the way that, um, you know, the Ninth Street divide, the redlining that is still a reality in this city, the food deserts, um, place, you know, some groups of kids have opportunities to participate in summer camps at uh, the Science Center or Camp Hi Ho or places that provide them a wealth of experiences. Whereas, whereas there, there is a whole group of other kids who don't get those type of opportunities and are, are relying on the public education system. And all too often, the public education system is starved for the resources to adequately um, provide those students opportunities and to give the wraparound services that will uh, aid in ensuring that they're able to catch up, that they're able to, to stay caught up and to excel. And so I think uh, that we're in a very, 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 very uh, interesting time, a very important time. Whereas we are going back to school in the coming week, um, uh, many of our disadvantaged families, they're not returning to school. Uh, in the coming week. We have uh, homeless students that we have not been able to locate yet um, that we must locate. Uh, many families are still fearful of the COVID-19 pandemic and um, you know what it might mean if, if a child brings it home to an elderly relative. 23% of black students in JCPS uh, are reared by a grandparent or an older adult. Um, and so we have to keep all of that in mind as we think about um, what looks like getting back to normal. And we're not so sure if we're getting back to normal or if we're uh, sort of experimenting with, <laughs> with trying to get back to normal. And, and we're kind of hoping that these variants and all these other things uh, don't cause cause any trouble. So uh, again, I say pray for us this week uh, because we have a lot of things to kind of hold, hold together. We always learn something new from a crisis mm -hmm. and how we come out of a crisis because crisis also means opportunity. And I think that we have seen that we could do far more than we ever thought we could. So on, on that note, I'm, I think that going back to normal is not exactly what I would want to see, but capitalizing on what we've been able to do during this experience. Well, and let me build on that too, because I wanted to ask Corey if he would just engage in a, a 60 second public service announcement of civic education. <laughs> how, how are the public schools funded and how do voters get to influence that? So that yeah. they, so that we know how, as voters, we can not go back to the normal starvation of the public schools. Mm -hmm. Well, number one, you can, you can. Well, this is being taped on Thursday, so I don't. Um, right now, I'm kind of holding my breath because there is a bill uh, at the state house uh, that is attempting to um, uh, to again use public tax dollars. Um, to provide vouchers um, to, to private schools, to charter schools. Uh, that ends up taking funds off of the table uh, for public education. The issue with that is private schools can be selective with their student population. Mm -hmm. Charter schools can be selective with their student population. The public schools systems has an, a legal obligation to educate every single child in that is a resident of that city no excuses whether they are differently abled whether they have some type of of learning difficulty or whether they have a behavioral difficulty we cannot turn those students away we must educate them which means that it takes a lot of money to run uh JCPS. It takes, and it, it, the reason that it takes so much money is because we are a big tent. Every, it's a whosoever will, and everybody <laughs> can come and be educated. The way the funding is allocated, you it is allocated through 
local taxes. Uh, so you, back, I guess, four months ago, we were having a big debate about uh, increasing um, taxes for public schools. And there were a lot of people who were upset about it because they felt like it was more money going to the public school system. Well, that money is actually going uh, to build and to repair schools because, you know, you cannot build or repair schools without money. And many of our schools are at the end of life. Then there's another funding mechanism from the state coifers um, through a process known as SEEK. And unfortunately, uh, SEEK funding has been declining over the last 10 to 13 years in ways that uh, have been damaging to the public education system, not just Jefferson County. I've, I've been in conversation with people all across the Commonwealth and that SEEK funding, the decrease in it uh, has negatively impacted districts throughout the state. And then there is federal funding. When you hear of Title IX and so forth, uh, that comes from the federal level and it takes all of those funding mechanisms to make your local public schools work. I, that's probably you, and I, I just want to say, I, I don't want to get into an argument about this, but I think, and I'm, I'm not sure it's a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in our state, it, it's a zero. All education at all levels in all different schools need to be funded more. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and they're all struggling. Uh, so, uh, and I understand we shouldn't be taking money from public schools just to do private schools, but private schools also need funding because Lord knows I've been a pastor often enough to say trying to run a pri private school is enormously, that's why I don't have any hair anymore <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not always, we sometimes play one against the other. All boats need to rise. Uh, and, you know, obviously colleges and, as well, we just don't spend the money on education that is really needed to make sure all kids, wherever they come from, are educated well. And uh, but unfortunately, we get into these different games that people play uh, and state legislators who. Uh, where's my votes coming from sometimes? Right. And, and that's that's the issue. And that's why education as a whole is damaged. Uh, also, I, I think it is it, it bears underscoring that um, the monies that are spent on athletics from <laughs> high schools <laughs> all the way up to college. And, and when you think about how much money is 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 created, um, by those athletics, uh, it's it's interesting when you look at U of L, what they spend, what they uh, pay their professors, you know, what they invest in uh, many of their departments, and then you look at what they what they make uh, at a U of L football game or a U of L basketball game. It makes you scratch your head and say, you know, maybe if we <laughs> kind of did this differently balance these books we would be able to you know fun education uh without always cutting cutting um opportunities for people to be intellectually enriched uh and, and placing that on the altar of athletics and other things all right very good panel i want to move on to our second topic we're about halfway through our program moral side of the news we're recording this program ahead of the one-year anniversary of the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. A planned demonstration is expected to draw hundreds of people to downtown Louisville. So at this moment, while we cannot speak directly to how the demonstration unfolded, we can discuss the sober one-year anniversary. Breonna's family is still calling for justice. There has been a ban on no-knock warrants. Louisville officials announced plans to place a marker honoring Breonna Taylor in Jefferson Square Park, where protesters have gathered regularly to call for justice. The marker will also include the names of George Floyd, David McAtee, and Tyler Girth. So panel, I'm interested in your thoughts as we approach this one year mark. Well, what, what happened that night was a tragedy and a travesty. And I think that we as citizens need to affirm that uh, we expect and demand better than that from law enforcement. Um, that uh, the care that needs to go into uh, deciding whether to go into someone's home uh, and how you're going to do it and when you're gonna do it and why you're gonna do it, all of that needs maximum scrutiny so that we are all protected. And uh, so I think that lifting up the memory of that night 
if it if it serves to remind us of uh, precious human lives and of the of what we deserve to expect from law enforcement, then it will be it will serve a good purpose. I think one of the things that's happened over the past year, going back to George Floyd and obviously many other ones years and years before that, for some reason, I, I think the Breonna Taylor case here, obviously in Louisville, has caused a lot of conversations among people who didn't have the conversation before about the whole question of how law enforcement should operate. And uh, I don't really like the term defunding police because I'm not sure that's a good term. I think transforming the police is probably a much better word. And there's lots of groups. I'm part of a couple of groups that are working on that uh, and trying to work even with the police department and stuff like that on. I, I think one thing I've heard from some police chiefs and, and some people is that sometimes we like teachers. We ask too much. Uh, they got to solve every problem. And, and, and we've laid too much and they, they had to deal with mental illness when they're not specifically trained for that. So I, I think we need to learn on both sides. How do we get, move forward? But uh, we need the police need help from other people with sometimes without a badge and without a gun uh, in some situations because that just it's a red flag in front of people. So there's lots of things we need to talk about. I'm hoping the, the discussion will continue to be serious and realize, uh, as I've heard in one situation, that sometimes we need to apologize for when we've made mistakes, as we all need to do, as, as we as Christians believe. Uh, when we're sinners, we're sinners. Let's name our mistakes and how do we get beyond this? Uh, and that that means all sides, uh, because I think there are there, there are some things we don't know. Both sides have been disadvantaged about this. But uh, obviously, the loss of human life is uh, and the way we've casually dealt with that has been appalling in the past year. I, um, I agree. Um, I think, though. One thing that we have learned nationally is that American policing is sick. Uh, the argument can be made that global policing is sick, but we know that there is something uniquely wrong with the way American law enforcement carries out its duties, and especially the way that it uh, engages with black communities uh, across across the U.S. Um, and so. I am, I'm kind of infuriated, I guess that would be the appropriate word as I reflect on a year. I remember when the Breonna Taylor uh, murder happened. I remember the initial um, statements that were, that was made about it, that it was uh, a drug bust, bust gone wrong, that there were no body cameras that um, someone opened fire and the police uh, fired back and uh, a woman died as a consequence of it. And that was the statement. And it, the case was kind of swept under the rug until uh, her, her family filed a lawsuit and brought national attention to it. Um, I am disappointed that uh, the justice sort of kind of that was meted out um, took so long, uh, the firing of some of the police officers who were involved and they were fired because of technicalities. Um, there did not seem to be a will to actually do what was right at first. We could have circumvented a summer and a fall full of protest had those officers been fired um, this time last year when it was a, the powers that be were aware that they were covering something up and that these individuals had been um, involved in wrongdoing that, ex that extended much, much further than the Breonna Taylor case. Um, 
And then in the final analysis, those officers were fired on a technicality. They were not fired because they murdered an innocent woman. They were not fired because of a no-knock warrant that should not have been granted in the first place. And that certainly should have not been administered at 1 a.m. in the morning. So, so there are a lot of things that I think still uh, that are still infuriating about this situation. It has pulled with the racism of this community um, uh, and has placed it in broad, broad light. And it has also reminded us that uh, there are people who care more about a economically thriving downtown than they care about black life in Louisville. Because now what we're trying to do is not ensure that the police department is addressed uh, for the long term, we're trying to get downtown back up to uh, being a, a economic uh, strong point of the city and people are placed beneath profit. And that's, that's not a good thing. I think that the apathy of the white community has to look in the mirror and say, this is not justice. Mm -hmm. It is not justice just to be able to put a plaque in Jefferson Square is not enough. And I'm hoping that this is a solemn occasion and somber occasion, but also leaving that call for action and leaving that call that the people of faith have something to say about what happened on that day. There was an article in the paper about somebody said, I don't wanna to go to church anymore because all they talk about is politics. Well, some theologians say, well, you preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And I think it's time that the apathy needs to end and we start here because this was global. This wasn't George Floyd and Brianna were global, not just national. And we have to come up with some answers. I think the key element is trying to get everybody at the table and everybody listening to one another at the table and sometimes we have to admit we're wrong sometimes. And people need to hear that sometimes. Uh, but I think there are some lot of possibilities that I don't think were there a year ago. So I'm hopeful, but I think Corey, you said it well that there are, there are still things that have not been addressed in this whole process that need to be addressed. I'll, I'll say a couple of quick things because I know we're running out of time. One is that uh, I, Iceland, the country of Iceland in its entire history has only ever had one person die because of the exercise of law enforcement's duties. So you know, when you talk about the sickness that we have and that we take so much violence for granted, there's a we've had a lot of flooding lately and rivers will always go over the bank that's softest and lowest we need to create higher tougher boundaries around law enforcement otherwise that river will continue to overflow and thank you marion taylor for that closing comment on our program moral side of the news join us again next week for another edition of moral side of the news we'll be here until then Stay safe and be well and have a great week. And thank you, panel. See you next time.